and missed God's will. And I hadn't got time to teach on this. I've got a, a series entitled Lessons from Elijah that you could get that series and it would go into great depth showing all of this. But in the 19th chapter of First Kings, Elijah went down to um, Mount Sinai and the Lord appeared unto him and he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He was supposed to be there where the revival was, but he had left God's will. He didn't fulfill God's will. And God gave him another chance and said, God, what are you doing, Elijah? And instead of Elijah saying, God, I'm sorry, I failed and asking for mercy and grace. Instead, he says, it's not my fault. I'm the only one serving God. I, there's nobody left but me. And this uh, servant of Ahab had already told Elijah in the 18th chapter that there were a hundred prophets, ministers that were still alive and serving God. Elijah knew better. But you know what? When you get into fear and you get into depression, you don't operate rationally. You're going by how you feel, not what you know the truth to be. And so Elijah knew different. And yet he says, I'm the only one. There's nobody left but me. And so God, uh, I hadn't got time to go through the whole story, but he came back and asked him a second time. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah answered with the same question, same answer. You know, if God gives you a retake on his test, it's because you didn't answer it right the first time. That's the only reason he had asked you the same question again is because you missed it the first time. So don't give the same answer. But Elijah answered the exact same thing. I'm the only one. And God told him, Elijah, I have over 7,000 people in the nation who have not bowed their knee unto Baal. He told Elijah he was wrong. And then guess what he told Elijah to do? He says, go anoint your replacement. And he, gave, he spoke in an audible voice to Elijah, told him to anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, told him to anoint Jehu to be king over Israel, and then told him to anoint Elijah, Elisha to take his position as prophet. Elijah got up and immediately went and anointed Elisha to take his place, but he didn't do the other two things that God inspired him to do or told him to do. And you can prove that because over in 2 Kings chapter 8 and chapter 9, it was his successor, Elisha, who anointed Haziel to be king, and Elisha, who anointed Jehu to be king over Israel. Elijah didn't do it, or Elisha never would have done it. Elisha had to fulfill God's plans that were originally intended for Elijah. Elijah did not fulfill all of God's plan. This didn't mean that God hated him, because in second chapter of 2 Kings, Elijah was caught up into heaven and never died. He was caught up into heaven in a whirlwind. And so God still accepted him and loved him, but he didn't fulfill God's plan for his life. And you know, part of it, one of the big things is because his imagination saw himself dead. When he saw that, he ran for his life. That's talking about in the imagination. If you can't control your imagination... If you can't make it a positive imagination, hope, and, and that comes through focusing on God's Word and the things that God has spoken to you, if you can't do that, you won't fulfill God's will. You are going to have an imagination. You are going to see things and conceive things in your heart. And if you can't see what God has told you coming to pass, then you'll see failure. You'll see yourself being just like everybody else you'll see yourself as being powerless. You'll see yourself as being only human. Your imagination functions. You can't keep it from functioning. All you can do is choose whether it's going to be positive, influenced and directed by the Word of God, or are you going to let it be influenced by this world in the way that everybody else is? You can't keep it from working. And the power that's in your imagination will start bringing all of this to pass, whether it's positive or negative. You can't stop imagination, but you can choose whether it's positive or negative. And the primary way that you choose that is by focusing on the things of God. Look at this in Acts chapter 27, verse 20. This is talking about where Paul was on his way to Rome. He was a prisoner and he was on this ship. He told them not to take off because God had shown him and that it was going to be dangerous. There was going to be a storm. So he advised the captain of the ship not to go, but they did it anyway. And then they came into this tremendous hurricane. 
And uh, it looked like that they were all going to die. In Acts chapter 27, verse 20, it says, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. See, we're talking about hope, a positive imagination. And it says all hope was taken away. How? Because of circumstances. If you're just looking at circumstances... You aren't going to have hope because circumstances, again, I've said this so many times, but it bears repeating that we live in a fallen world. As good as this world is, which, man, I just get so blessed thinking about the beauty that God created and all of the things that God has done. But as good as this world is, it is not the way that God originally created it to be. It is corrupted. We live in a fallen world. Even though that there are people around who there are some wonderful people and there are some great things that are done, there is also a lot of fallen human nature out there. And there is murder and there's rape and there's thievery and there's lying and there's all of this selfishness. And I guarantee you there is just always, always, always going to be something to hinder you and to discourage you and to depress you. You cannot just live in this natural realm and be hopeful. Hope comes through the scripture. You are going to have to withdraw from this natural world to the degree that at least you spend some time focused on God and what he's promised you. And if you don't, you're going to be hopeless. It says that all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Why? Because of the natural surroundings. And in verse 21, it says, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Now, Paul was in the exact same circumstances as everybody else on that ship. And everybody else, it says, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, abstinence from what? Well, it was abstinence from food. I believe that he was fasting, but you know what? He also was withdrawing from all of these negative people and the words of doubt that they were speaking. He was probably in the belly of this ship, focused on the Lord and seeking God and not looking at the wind and the waves and all of these things. If you are going to have hope, you are going to have to abstain from all of the negative, critical things that are being said and done in this world. And I tell you, that's just the way that it is. You need a positive imagination and that's going to happen only through abstinence. And it's just the way that it is. Boy, there's so much more. I'm just about out of time today. But um, God is the God of all hope. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. God is a God of hope. You know, if you would just open up the door a crack, if you would just say, Father, I admit that I've been negative, that I have let this world take away all hope, and I know what you've told me and some things that you want from my life, but it just seems like that there is no basis for this hope. But you're a God of hope. I'm asking you to give me joy and hope in believing Father, just paint a picture. Show me a way out. You know, if you would just open up the door a crack, you don't have to be the strongest faith person that ever was. But just say, Father, I'm not able to believe at this moment, but I at least want to start hoping. I want to start dreaming of success. I want to see myself doing better than what I've done. I want to see myself operating in the power of the Holy Ghost. I ask you, you're the God of hope to give me hope. If you would just open up your door like that and invite the Lord's help, God is a God of hope. And I believe that he would come in like a mighty flood and he would fill you with hope. And then you have to maintain it. And you maintain it by keeping the things that God has done, like going back again to Romans 1, put value on what God has spoken unto you. Don't let the word of other people devalue God. Be thankful. Go back and rehearse all of your victories. Remind yourself of the good things that God has done. That will cause your imagination to become a positive imagination. It will get you into hope. And when that happens, your heart will become sensitive. You'll begin to hear and see things 
in the spiritual realm that you weren't able to see and hear when you were just living carnally and operating in, in the discouragement that affects everybody else. And if you will do those things, I promise you, you can stay full of God or you can fulfill God's will. It is possible to not only find God's will and then start following God's will, but it's possible to fulfill God's will. Paul said he did it. He had run the race. He had finished his course. And there was a crown laid up for him. We can do it. You can fulfill God's will for your life, but you're going to have to deliberately do all of these things that we've been talking about. And I tell you, I believe that this could change your life. I believe that this teaching could just revolutionize you. And if you fulfill God's will for your life, not only will you be blessed, but I guarantee you everybody around you will be blessed. That's what it's all about. We are blessed to be a blessing.